Thank you, Warren. I was thinking about having you read the passage today, but there's some big words in it. <laughs> it's going to catch up with me one day. Remember, you thought there were big words, too. <laughs> uh, well, we, we're blessed. We've got Thanksgiving coming, and we have a lot to be thankful for, don't we? Every day, uh, we have a lot to be thankful for. Um, Cindy had knee surgery, um, uh, scope, Tuesday. I don't know if you remember last week, but she was limping. It was scheduled, and she's doing fine. She's still on crutches. But we're, we're hosting about 15 people on Thanksgiving. So uh, she, she needs to get up and at them. <laughs> And she's listening, I think, so uh, we have lots of help, lots of, lots of help. Uh, well, we've come to chapter 12 in our study of uh, the Gospel of Luke, and what I want to do today and hope to do is to uh, read and study the first 12 verses of the chapter. Um, we're going to want to be careful as we go along, because this is another of those stretches of the gospel in which the internal connections uh, from one thought to the next are not always logically uh, evident. Do, do you ever struggle with that when you're reading passages? Okay, now we're talking about something different or is it the, the same? So we'll pay special attention to that. But I think, I uh, hope you don't think I'm uh, presumptuous. I, I think we've, we've captured it to some degree with the caption at the top of uh, the outline. Uh, there will come a day. There will come a day. We left off at the end of the last chapter with the aftermath of the tense confrontation between Jesus and the scribes and the Pharisees. The Lord had uh, sullied their reputation uh, a bit with his uh, frank evaluation of them as hypocrites, and he'll continue with that uh, in our passage today. When he, he left there, Luke concludes, if you look at the last uh, verses, when uh, he left there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to be very hostile and to question him closely on many subjects, plotting against him uh, to catch him in something he might say. But a theme will emerge now, uh, or at least come into clearer focus, which is that how we live our lives in relation to Jesus Christ has consequences. In fact, all of world history, as it turns out, uh, will ultimately be interpreted through the lens of peoples and nations, uh, acceptance or rejection of the claims that Christ made. And this will underscore for Jesus on this day the importance of a faithful and real witness for him. Uh, for there will come a day of the great unveiling of men's and women's hearts, and both judgment and blessing will follow. So let's read it together, beginning in verse 1. Under these circumstances, after so many Thousands of people had gathered together that they were stepping on one another. He began saying to his disciples, first of all, notice that he began saying to his disciples, first of all, uh, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. But there is nothing covered up that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Accordingly, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in the inner rooms will be proclaimed upon the housetops. I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do, but I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two cents? Yet not one of them is forgotten before God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. 
And I say to you, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will confess him also before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will uh, not be forgiven him. When they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. As we've made our way uh, through our study of Luke, we've noted uh, often the increasing crowds who formed around Jesus and followed after him. Uh, that's because Luke, of all the gospel writers, uh, takes special note of them. He, he does so here, uh, painting an image of uh, myriads of people uh, thronging about the Lord so that they were in peril of, of trampling uh, on themselves. They were a mix, I presume, of both the curious who wanted to know uh, more, truly wanted to know more about what they had seen and heard, and uh, the usual ambulance chasers uh, who were attracted to the spectacle formed in the Lord's wake. Either way, uh, the trailing assemblage was noteworthy and remarkable. Those circumstances and the increasing danger from the Jewish authorities trailing them at every step uh, might give anyone pause before choosing to take the side of Jesus. So Jesus began speaking again, uh, though this time uh, Luke pointedly tells us firstly to his disciples. They had made their allegiance to him known. Uh, and so they would receive this message first. He warned them, beware of the leaven of the, the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now I know uh, we have some bakers uh, in this room. I know because I've tasted some of uh, your, your, your work and uh, you can probably instruct us on how just a little pinch of leaven or yeast can a transform a lump of uh, dough. A th Thanksgiving has us thinking about uh, these things. Uh, but the leavening is not always to a, a, a positive end. Uh, Jesus uses it in a metaphorical way to describe the corruptive effect the Pharisees' conduct has on the body politic of Israel. It works invisibly, but slowly and surely to sour the dough of their followers. Specifically, Jesus identifies the Pharisees' leaven as, as hypocrisy. Uh, hypocrisy, as we've said before, is an especially ugly thing. Uh, you know, we always say, I love humility, especially when I see it in myself. I hate hypocrisy, especially when I see it in myself. It's, a, it's an ugly thing, but and sadly, it can be found in, in all of us. Uh, it's to put a false face forward, uh, pretending to be one thing when it really, the reality is very different. It means play acting, uh, hiding oneself, real self, be behind a mask. But it is ultimately futile. Uh, hip hypocrites will ultimately be unmasked at, at the moment the Pharisees had a free reign for their hypocrisy, but the hidden reality of it uh, will in the end be made known. On that day, as verse 3 uh, indicates, what hypocrites have said in the dark uh, will be heard in the light, and, and what was only whispered behind closed doors will be shouted from the, the rooftops. Do you fear that? <laughs> I do, a little bit. Uh, the Pharisees' hypocrisy is short-sighted. Uh, there will come a day, when, which we soon come to see as Judgment Day, 
when it will all be laid bare. And that theme uh, forms the backdrop to our entire passage. Uh, these are Jesus' friends whom he addresses. He says that explicitly in verse 4. And now he has warned them to beware of the hypocrisy of these enemies who are pursuing him to do him harm. Uh, they, they are to be on guard against them because their uh, two-faced behavior is not at all harmless but is viciously aimed at those who dare to stand in their way. Uh, but now comes a more solemn warning uh, still that the danger in the Pharisees' devious behavior is the damage they can uh, inflict upon the people before they're unmasked. But there's a greater danger beyond that. Look at verse 4. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body. That exhortation, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, flies in the face of the normal uh, posture of a typical human being. Uh, we are afraid of people who can kill us, who delight in killing innocents, and who are overwhelmingly more powerful than us. We, we rightly avoid these people at all costs. We understand that intuitively, and, and popular culture uh, verifies it. The very best action movies are the ones uh, where our hero is, is being threatened uh, for, uh, of his very life. Uh, will he be killed? Well, of course he won't be, but still, we're, we're, we're wondering. We're on the edge of our, our seat. But time would soon prove for Jesus and his followers, life is not a movie, and, and escape from those who killed the body would not always be possible. Now, however, Jesus emphasizes there is more to the story than that. That's the important thing. There's more to the story uh, than, than that. He says, friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do, but I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. I meant to say this during the reading, but you probably have in the margin of your Bible that word hell is actually Gehenna, uh, that was a, a valley uh, adjacent to uh, the city of Jerusalem. And in ancient times, during Israel's apostasy, they would kill babies. You know, it was part of their idolatry, their idolatrous uh, worship. And they would put the bodies of those dead babies in, in this uh, valley. And so it became uh, a place to avoid at all costs. And at this time, archaeologists tell us, uh, that's where they put their garbage, in Gehenna. And uh, frequently fires, you could see fires burning. So it became symbolic uh, for hell. Well, those, uh, those who kill in, in this life can do no more. It is, if you think about it, it's their ultimate achievement to destroy another person's uh, body, but they're unable to touch the essential life of a person. Yet we do fear that. I think I can speak for all of you. We do fear that. As, as we've said, it's only natural. Uh, but the person of faith understands there is more uh, to it. Uh, to life than this life. And in this he is distinguished from the materialist who knows only this life. Uh, this is the posture of the materialist who has no faith in a living savior, but he imagines uh, death to be the worst possible eventuality, bringing a complete end uh, to any reason for existence. It's understandably easy for even we of the living faithful uh, to fall into that trap. But our souls are eternal. Uh, we live beyond the grave. That's a foundational tenet of, uh, of our faith. 
Uh, we live, we, we have eternal life. We live beyond uh, the, the grave. And so uh, God alone controls the final destiny of men. People should fear him then rather than those who can merely inflict physical death. And so we see that there are two different categories of fear. Uh, one is the dread or fright of, that, uh, of, of threatening harm. We fear illness and failure and disappointment and rejection. We fear all kinds of things that we meet up with out in this cruel uh, world. Uh, we, fear, we fear these things. As we've noted, we fear evil persons who desire evil and murder against us. But there is an altogether different kind of fear that is actually related to love. And it's the fear of God. It is the fear that is found in every true child of God, implanted in us by the Holy Spirit to enable us to approach God rightly. Leon Morris described it as an attitude compounded of a recognition of the greatness and righteousness of God on the one hand and our readiness to sin on the other. I'm gonna repeat that because I think it's a very good thing that he's written. It is an attitude compounded of a recognition of the greatness and righteousness of God on the one hand and our readiness to sin on the other. Fear of this kind guards against a presumption then. It is the reverential awe that is suited to an encounter with the holy and living God. But this fear too contains a sense of potential dread. It's important for us to recognize that and even embrace it. Uh, it is the very real dread of hell for those who stand against him. I will warn you whom to fear, he says. Fear the one who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. This is the fear that uh, befell uh, Isaiah there in Isaiah chapter uh, 6, when he saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, the text says, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, and one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole world is full of his glory, and the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then Isaiah said, you know this, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. I'm ruined, he says. My eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. It was that kind of fear, the fear of God that overcame Isaiah. And before that, uh, in the book of Exodus, we read of Moses standing before this burning uh, bush in the wilderness, and God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, do not come near here. Remove the sandals from your feet. Uh, the ground you're standing on is holy ground. And you remember Moses hid his face, the text says, because he was afraid. He was afraid to look at this holy God. It might be helpful too to go into the future and recall that scene uh, in Revelation 14 verse 7 where we find the angel who John says had the eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and with a loud voice he said, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Hebrews 10, 31 declares, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He is the holy and righteous God, and one day he will judge the earth, and no one will escape the searching eyes of the judge of heaven and earth. 
Uh, this is the one whom men and women and boys and girls uh, even ought to fear. As Jesus puts it, fear the one who after he has killed has authority to cast you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Uh, Jesus had no qualms about speaking about hell for he knew uh, the dread of it. He would suffer it himself in the stead of those he came to die for, uh, to save them from hell. And here he speaks of it unambiguously. God is infinitely aware of all that will befall us in this life, and he is not one to let the faithful perish ultimately, neither, neither uh, the godless to have the final say. There will come a day when the Christ who came to suffer hell will come again in judgment and with the authority to cast into hell, he will separate out those who belong to him from those who opposed him and those he will cast into hell. And therefore he warns, uh, fear him. This is not a pleasant thing to talk about. Um, we know people that don't know the Lord. Perhaps they're a part of our family. Uh, all the more reason to make sure uh, we're bearing a faithful witness to them. I just said that. Uh, those who oppose him, those he will cast into hell. It's horrible. Um, but it's, it's, it's just, it's righteous, and because it's God doing it, it is, it is good. Fear him. Now remember, he was speaking at this moment first to his disciples. So now in verses 6 and 7, he counsels that they do not fear, that they do not fear. Are not five sparrows sold for two cents, Jesus asked. Yet not one of them is forgotten before God. Indeed, the very heads, hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear. You're more valuable than many uh, sparrows. This is a variation of that lovely theme that we've seen before in the Sermon on the Mount, in which Jesus said, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And so here he specifies uh, sparrows to symbolize the seemingly ins insignificant. Uh, back then, uh, small birds like sparrows uh, were sold uh, and eaten, uh, considered delicacies. They didn't eat sparrows. Jesus is using sparrows to stand for these little tiny uh, birds. And the going rate for them apparently was five uh, for two cents. A cent wasn't very much, so it didn't cost very much to buy five of them. Interestingly enough, in Matthew's account, uh, Matthew uh, 10, 29, he said that Jesus said, two are said to be sold for one cent. So apparently, if you bought four instead of two, you'd get an extra one thrown in. So it's like a baker's dozen, except it's not a dozen, it's five. God is so great and so benevolent that he forgets none of these in insignificant uh, birds. He, his knowledge and care extend to the most minuscule uh, items. Even the hairs of our head, Jesus says, are numbered by him. Even the ones, I suppose, that disappear down the shower drain. <laughs> what happened? But what the Lord is saying is that God knows the tiniest uh, details about the disciples of Jesus and is lovingly mindful of them. If he counts each of the hairs on their heads, they have no need to fear mere men. And, and one might take all the sparrows in the world, uh, but each of his disciples is more important to God than all of them. And therefore, 
they can face life without fear. But these are serious issues at stake. The idea of hell, I've already said it, is a serious uh, topic. And likewise, the attitude one has toward God and His Son, the attitude that will determine one's ultimate destiny, heaven or hell, is of the most serious consequence to God and to His Son. And isn't that why people uh, seek to avoid mention of it? They mock it. Uh, they, they talk about how uh, you're preaching uh, uh, fire and brimstone. You're uh, fundamentalists. This is fundamentalist uh, preaching. But how one sides or refuses to side publicly with Jesus is the most telling signal of the condition of their souls and of their, their true allegiance. And therefore, Jesus doubles down on his challenging proposition to the disciples, beginning now in verse 8, that there are only two responses available to a person when confronted with this man and his claims. I say double down because uh, we have only shortly before heard him say much the same thing <clears throat> as here in chapter 9, verses 25 and 26, after Peter had made his great confession that you are the Christ of God, Jesus issued a warning to the wider audience uh, who was there at Caesarea Philippi. Uh, what is a man profited, he said, if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of his holy angels. And so now here, see, in verse 8, he offers the same warning from a slightly different uh, angle. And I say to you, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will confess uh, him also before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. So it's a double saying, isn't it? Um, uh, both a wonderful and at the same time terrible uh, contrast of our own confession or denial of Jesus in this life and the ultimate confession or denial of the men and women of the world from the throne of God himself. There will come a day when that reckoning will be held. Shame and denial on the one hand versus identification and confession on the other. These contrasting postures are of the utmost importance to the Lord Jesus Christ. They are important to Him. And if they're important to Him, they should be important to us. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you'll be uh, saved. Well, here Jesus says, everyone who confesses me before the Son of Man will confess before men, the Son of Man will confess Him also before the angels of God. It's what one commentator called a warm encouragement for Judgment Day. I like that. It is. It's a warm encouragement for Judgment Day. But then the Lord counters that with, He who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. The contrast could not be more stark, and it underscores how important to all of mankind is identification with Jesus Christ and public confession of Him. I say public. That's an important part of it. Uh, it can only be a public confession He has in mind because the corresponding confession or denial by God will be publicly made in that day. There will come a day. Uh, how could he have made it clearer than, than that? Uh, those who have denied Jesus Christ in this life and have refused to identify themselves with him will one day stand before God and discover their stubborn choice then 
has been ratified at that point, then it will be too late. Today then is a call to self-examination. Do you publicly uh, confess Jesus as very God, a very God, and as your own personal savior? If you do not do that, or if you have not done that, you would do well to test yourself, to assure yourself that you are of the true faith. That was Paul's admonition to the church in Corinth, you remember. He said, examine yourself, examine yourself. Well, perhaps it was the solemnity of that challenge that led the Lord to go on to the next uh, very sobering and for some c confusing statement in verse 10. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. This is a difficult, a difficult statement uh, for, for the simple reason that it seems to contradict the consistent tenor of the Bible that uh, assures whoever comes to Christ in faith will find forgiveness from him. Their sins will be uh, forgiven. But now Jesus states that there is a sin that is unforgivable. It is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So we want to understand uh, what, what the Lord meant. Uh, first, notice, he, he separates out sin against himself as, as being uh, forgivable and, and, and of a different category than blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, okay? He says blasphemy against the Son of Man is forgive, can be forgiven. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven. And the reason is that such sin as blasphemy against him normally is committed in ignorance. Uh, Paul writes of that in 1 Timothy 1, uh, 13, that he had himself been shown mercy for his own pre-conversion acts of malice against Jesus because he acted ignorantly in unbelief. Uh, we see this also illustrated specifically in the experience of Peter on the Mount of uh, Transfiguration. I, I finally got to uh, listen to one of Dr. Bingham's messages from the family camp uh, that I didn't get to go to. Uh, it was very good, by the way. I, I'd listened to, to one, but uh, in, in one of those uh, messages, he made this very point. That there on the Mount, he was, he, he was talking about the Mount of Transfiguration, and there on the Mount with the Lord Jesus, and, and, and caught up in the wonder then of the presence also of Moses and, and the great prophet uh, e Elijah. Uh, Peter uh, uh, had what Dr. Bingham called the silly idea of erecting three tabernacles for each of them. One for Jesus, one for uh, the great prophet, one for uh, Moses. And uh, he called it a silly idea, but, but what, he was, what Peter was really doing was blaspheming him uh, to compare the Holy Son of God to mere men was blasphemy. But Jesus forgave him. And Peter would go on to commit worse sins than that. And you and I have committed worse sins than that against uh, the Son of Man. Uh, Peter went on to be a great paragon of, of faith. So Peter's blasphemy was nipped in the bud by the, the sound of the Lord God coming out of heaven. That didn't last very long. But, but to understand blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and, and why it is not forgiven, we need to go back to what is known as the Bilzebul uh, controversy. I'm not seeing as well as I used to, do you notice? <laughs> I brought my glasses with me this time, but week by week it's getting 
uh, worse. I, I find old notes. I shouldn't take time for this. I find old notes from back in the day, and I had to print so big because, and now I'm nearing that again, but uh, we need to go back to the Bills of Bull controversy, and we touched on that briefly in the last chapter in verses 15 and following, uh, where the Pharisees, remember, uh, accused, he had cast a demon out of a man, and the Pharisees accused him of, of casting demons out by the power of the prince of, of demons, by Bills of Bull. Uh, now, there's two other passages we can go to, we're not going to, but one is Mark 3, 28 and the verses after that, and the other is Matthew 12, 31. And in those passages, if we went to them, uh, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is referred to as an eternal uh, sin. And the reason appears to be that it involves a conscious rejection of truth conveyed by the Holy Spirit and that is continually rejected so that it becomes the bent of that person's life rather than admitting or accepting what they know to be true because the Holy Spirit has made it clear, they instead attribute his work rather to Satan. It is the conscious, persistent, wicked rejection of the Holy Spirit's witness and the satanic defamation of his character. This is the situation, maybe this will help. This is the situation the author of Hebrews uh, feared when he described the condition of certain men in Hebrews chapter 6. I know many of you have studied that. Some of you have different interpretations. But uh, these men that he was concerned with had been exposed to every spiritual privilege. They had been, he uses these terms in Hebrews chapter 6. He uses these terms that make you think they might be Christian. And I think he's, he uses them purposely. They're, they're not normally used of true uh, believers. So he, he says that uh, these men had been enlightened and they had the key word, <clears throat> tasted of the heavenly gift and tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. But then they had uh, fallen away and the author states that it is impossible to renew them again to repentance. That's the unforgivable uh, sin. It's the eternal sin. So he fears of the impossibility of repentance in the case of men such as these. But then he remember he pivots uh, to uh, assure his readers that he's convinced of better things concerning them, things that accompany salvation. They're polar opposites, the impossibility of grace and the assurance of the grace of salvation. So the Lord here in Luke 12 seems to be warning those who might be wavering in their commitment to him, perhaps becoming hesitant to publicly uh, identify with him, that they need to heed the convicting work of the Holy Spirit of God and stay the course. And the alternative could be fatal. But for true disciples of Jesus, there will be difficult times ahead. And now, uh, leaving the thought of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit behind, the Lord speaks to the promise of the Spirit's aid to them in the days ahead. We know from the book of Acts and from the, the, the New Testament epistles, uh, the terrible trials the young church uh, of Christ would face. But they are even at this moment at the forefront of their loving Savior's concern for them. They're going to, this is Jesus, they're, they're going to bring you hostily uh, before the synagogues and these dreaded uh, rulers and authorities, uh, or they're going to seek to do to you what they are uh, now planning to do to me. Uh, but do not worry how often the Lord uh, enjoins upon us the loving counsel to cease from our worries and depend upon him. Do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you are to say. <clears throat> I probably don't need to say this, 
although every preacher I've ever heard when it comes to this says it, uh, but this is not an excuse for teachers uh, to not to put aside their books and to put, put aside their study and go watch football. Uh, this is not what this is. <clears throat> I remember Dr. Hendricks uh, telling uh, his students, men, someone's going to sweat, either you before or them then. And it's true. Uh, so that's not what he's talking about. No, the Lord was indicating the importance of giving a good defense in, of, of the faith in the face of persecution and his spirit could be counted on to bring to their lips the right words to further the gospel and advance God's kingdom. So I'm closing with uh, a good illustration. Uh, we don't have to venture far to find such an illustration of spirit-empowered defense under pressure. If, if only one, we should mention Peter. In Acts chapter 4, after a, a torrent of bold preaching, and uh, public testimony that resulted in enormous growth in uh, the church, uh, miraculous healings and, and the increasing vexation of the Jewish leaders. Uh, those leaders uh, brought out the temple guard and they took Peter and John and they threw them into jail. And the next day they fetched them and placed them in the center of the prestigious a Sanhedrin with the high priest and the high priestly family, uh, two fishermen who had spent three years uh, with Jesus and these authorities uh, began to demand answers. Let's hear it, they said. By what power or in what name have you done all these things? And our Luke, uh, the author of our gospel, tells us what happened next. Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke to them. Filled with the Holy Spirit, he spoke to them. This was, this was off the cuff. We quote it over and over again. We quote it in, at wedding ceremonies. It's so beautiful. It's so profound. Filled with the Holy Spirit, he said, it was by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, what boldness. Point his finger at them whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Oh, really? That's right, God raised him from the dead. By this name, this formerly lame beggar stands before you today in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders. They knew Psalm 118. They knew what he was saying. This, he is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And, and there is salvation in no one else. That's blasphemy. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. By the power of the Spirit who came to his aid at just the right moment, Peter's forthright testimony and powerful boldness left these self-important religious hypocrites speechless in response. Luke goes on to add they had nothing to say in reply. He left them speechless. Well, we only just recently heard Dan uh, bring us the exposition of the final chapter of the Gospel of John. It was wonderful. So we remember the Lord's words uh, to Peter about his future when he would grow old. And the Lord said he would stretch out his hands and someone else would gird him and, and bring him where he would not wish uh, to go. He said this, John wrote, to signify what, by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. He will have lived his life without fear of men, but courageously maintaining his confession. For all of us, there will come a day when our own confession will be exposed 
to the heavenly light of God's presence and, and how we've lived our life in relation to Jesus will be fully revealed. And th therefore, let us heed the apostles' counsel from Ephesians 5.15. Be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. Let us walk in the fear of God and not in the fear of men. Let us pray. Father, how merciful you are uh, to us uh, to forgive all our sins. Uh, your patience is, uh, is, is wonderful. Um, your spirit of forgiveness. Uh, your desire that you receive glory from us. Uh, we want to do that. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit would strengthen us, sanctify us, that we might more and more publicly identify ourselves with him and confess him to our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers, our family, to your glory. In Christ's name, amen.